We welcome our viewers to our ongoing discussion of the scriptures of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm Terry Ball from the Department of Ancient Scripture at Brigham Young University, and joining me in our discussion today is Professor Terry Zink, also from the Department of Ancient Scripture. It's good to be here, Terry. Thank you, Terry. Good to have you with us. And two other colleagues from the Department of Ancient Scripture, Professor Michael Rhodes. Welcome, Michael. Happy to be here. And Professor Ray Huntington. Thanks for coming, Ray. Good to be here. We are spending our time discussing in depth the writings of the great prophet Isaiah, fulfilling the Savior's mandate to search diligently this prophet. And today we get to begin our discussion with uh, chapter 18, a remarkable prophecy addressed to a land called the land shadowing with wings. It begins with the phrase, woe to the land shadowing with wings. The footnote there suggests that woe is not maybe the best word. It's from a Hebrew choy, which means hello or hey, you land shadowing with wings. And then it gives some indication of what this land shadowing with wings might be. Uh, it's a land that's beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, we see in verse 1. And a land that is sending ambassadors by the sea, even in vessels of bulrushes, or more likely papyri, upon the waters. Now, the land shadowing with wings has been variously identified. What's the traditional interpretation for the land shadowing with wings? Egypt is, is uh, the one that's generally... Uh, talked about. It's beyond Ethiopia. There's the, the papyrus immediately uh, calls to mind Egypt, uh, which is the land of papyrus where it grows along the Nile. So and why would he call it the land shadowing with wings? What is, what is that imagery suggesting? Well, there's, there, there's protection there and uh, possibly as well there's the uh, uh, imagery of, of Egyptian iconography uh, where, where the, the winged sun disk is, is the protecting power of the, the, the gods of Egypt as well. So there, there, there's probably multiple depths of imagery here, but all, all seem to, to nicely point towards Egypt. Mm -hmm. Has Egypt ever been a source of protection for Israel and Judah? <clears throat> oh, certainly. Uh, throughout history, Egypt has been a place that the patriarchs have gone to in times of famine. Abraham goes there to avoid a famine. Joseph, as we know, goes there, and, and later on his brothers and his father uh, appear there to avoid the famine. And it's kind of, uh, Israel is kind of in between the two great powers, uh, uh, Assyria and, and Babylon in the uh, east and Egypt in the west. And many times Israel turns to Egypt to try and avoid the destruction that would be coming out of the north or out of the east from uh, Assyria and Babylon. You know, you're laying a really important historical context for this particular prophecy and several others that we're going to see in Isaiah chapter 20 and 30 and 31 as well. Because it seems that whenever there's an empire building nation coming out of Mesopotamia, be it the Babylonians or the uh, Assyrians or, or the Persians, that um, Egypt has wanted to kind of use Israel and Judah as, as a buffer zone, mm -hmm. haven't they? I think their feeling is if we can foment rebellion and strife in Israel and Judah, these empire-building nations won't, uh, will be too preoccupied to come and invade Egypt. Does that work for them? Not completely. Eventually, Assyria, in fact, conquers Egypt. And so and, does... And so does Persia. And, and Babylon, and the Greeks, and, and, and the Romans. Romans and, uh, and it goes on and on. The Mamluks, uh, even <laughs> more recent times. This goes back to one of the basic messages of the Old Testament that those people who put their trust in the arm of flesh will ultimately fail. Yeah, and that's what Egypt wants them to do, right? Yeah. When, when Babylon's coming yeah. to invade Judah or Assyria, Egypt is saying, if you'll rebel, we'll support you. We're right there for you. We'll send armies. We'll send all kinds of assistance. We're behind you all the way. You just rebel and we'll support you in this. And it seems like they listen in spite of the prophets like Jeremiah and Ezekiel are saying, don't trust Egypt. And here Isaiah is going to be saying, don't trust Egypt. They listen to Egypt. They trust Egypt. And when the time for the support for Egypt is, arrives. It's like, a, I think, doesn't no, Jeremiah use the image of, a, of a, a reed, a man who leans against the reed, and the reed is not going to be strong enough to support it, and it'll break and pierce the man's hand, and, and that'll be it. Yeah, yeah. In fact, the first person to use that yeah, is, is, is Lobsake yeah. yeah. when he's yelling propaganda up to the men in chapter 36. Exactly. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I think that that's kind of the context for one way that this prophecy is understood, the land shadowing with wings. Here we have Egypt that's sending ambassadors in bulrush or papyrus boats to, um, to Judah, apparently telling them to rebel 
and fight against the empire builders and promising them support if they would rebel. And so, verse 2, here we have this Egypt sending ambassadors by the sea and vessels of bulrushes upon the water, saying, Go ye to ye messengers to a nation that is scattered and pilled to a people terrible from their beginning. Who would that be? Israel. Israel or Judah, huh? Yeah. A nation that's meted out and trodden down, whose lands the rivers have spoiled. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. Assyria came through and spoiled them. Babylon will do this insane. And... Um, as we interpret it this way, we get the feeling then that they're sending ambassadors and, and here's what, here's what uh, Jehovah is <clears throat> telling them if you listen to those ambassadors. Uh, why don't you read for us verse 4, uh, verse 4 and 5 for us, please, Ray, and just kind of tell us what, what the message, summarize the message for us. For so the, Lord, for so the Lord said unto me, I will take my rest and I will consider in my dwelling place <clears throat> like a clear heat upon herbs and like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. For afore the harvest, when the bud is perfect and the sour grape is ripening in the flower, he shall both cut off the sprigs with pruning hooks and take away and cut down the branches. I, it's a great message. I mean, what God is saying is, uh, go ahead and send your messengers uh, in, into Judah to, to make this offer of protection. But uh, in the end, um, I'm going to control what happens here. And from my resting place, <clears throat> I'll make decisions that will um, have consequences for both Egypt and Judah. Uh, and he makes that um, promise in verse 5 <clears throat> that you can put all the plans you want together. You can plant everything you want and expect the harvest to come at this exact time. But I'm going to come in early and I'm cutting stuff down and I'll make it come out the way I want it to come out. So you might think that this is your plan you're going to do. Exactly. Develop. You've got the bud and things look like. Yeah. But when it's time for harvest, it'll be a heap. It sounds an awful lot like the imagery uses in the previous chapter, chapter 17, verses 9 through 11, yeah. with strange lips, doesn't it? <coughs> and then if you continue in the chapter, you read verse 6, that, um, that um, these cuttings are piled up and become a refuge for, for, well, for animals and birds and so yes. forth. Right. And, and then there's still the hope, though, at the end, that there eventually there will be a people that have come before the Lord, that have been scattered and pilled, that are present. There, there's going to be some remnant that's going to be faithful. You know, this um, maybe this is a good place to, to skip <coughs> over and pick up chapter 20 because it's a very similar message there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, we can give a date for chapter 20. Uh, in the year that Tartan <coughs> came unto Ashdod when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him. And if you look down in the footnotes, we're about 711 B.C., uh, when this prophecy is given. And um, Isaiah is told to do something really strange here. Um, he's told to uh, go loose the sackcloth, I'm in verse 2, from off thy loins, put off thy shoe from thy foot, and he did so walking naked and barefoot. And apparently Isaiah is going to be out walking naked and barefoot amongst the people, and they're going to come up and say, Isaiah, why are you walking naked and barefoot? And his response is supposed to be verse 3. Terry, why don't you read it for us? And the Lord said, Like as mine servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia. Go ahead and do verse 4 too. Sure. So shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians prisoners and the Ethiopians captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. Yeah. So what's he trying to tell them? It's, it's, this is a warning. This is a, this is a sign. He says, just like I'm walking around here naked without any shoes on, you will be led, uh, you, Egypt and Ethiopia, will be led as slaves. And one of the things that would happen to slaves is they would shave them and they would strip them so they're left kind of vulnerable and march them off into slavery when the nation was captured. Interesting object lesson. Of course, the question is, did Isaiah really have to walk around for these three years naked and barefoot? And the answer is, I don't know. We don't know. <laughs> Whether it's literal or figurative, but... Uh, I sure hope not. Yeah, but either way, <laughs> the, the message is the same. <clears throat> don't trust Egypt and Ethiopia to protect you because... They can't even protect themselves. Yeah. yeah. Not only will they not be able to stop you from going into slavery, they're going into slavery themselves. Uh, and uh, just a historical note, the reason they're talking about Ethiopia here at that time... Ethi uh, the uh, uh, pharaohs of Pharaoh. Egypt were Ethiopians. Yeah. They, they were from, from uh, the uh, uh, very southern uh, boundaries of Egypt. In, the in, Upper Nile, right? The Upper Nile, yeah. exactly. Yeah. 
You know, every time I read this, I think, what a message this is for Latter-day people. Because there are a lot of Egyptians that make all kinds of promises. You trust in us. Follow me. Do this and you'll be happy. And Isaiah's message is, there's no happiness in pursuing those ends. There's no happiness in, in going that way. Great message, great message. Now, I want to go back to chapter 18 because Latter-day Saints are fortunate. We understand when Nephi said we should liken the writings of Isaiah to ourselves, that, that we should do that. And our prophets have set a marvelous example of, from the writings of Isaiah, finding a lot of application uh, for the writings of, of Isaiah in our day. We say often that Isaiah wrote dualistically, that um, he would make a, write, give a prophecy that... Um, that could have more than one fulfillment, interpretation, or application. And I think chapter 18, in light of what prophets have taught us, and likening this chapter to themselves, is a good place to illustrate the idea of dualism. So let's talk a little bit now about what we understand from the teachings of modern prophets, another way to approach this in regards to the land shadowing with wings. Uh, Michael, why don't you go ahead and start okay, uh, us on uh, this. Let, let me uh, uh, quote a couple of uh, uh, the brethren. I'll, I'll start with Hiram. Hiram Smith, a brother of the prophet, who said, The gathering of Israel will be from the nations of North and South America, which is the land of Zion. North and South America are the symbols of the wings. So he's, he's interpreting there the, uh, uh, the reference being to the United States, or, or North and South America the, in, in the broadest sense. And then President Joseph Fielding Smith also noted, America is the land shadowing with wings spoken of by Isaiah that today is sending ambassadors by sea to a nation scattered and peeled, uh, having reference, of course, to, to scattered Israel uh, and, and uh, America being the uh, source of uh, the uh, gospel message going out to gather a scattered Israel. So America is the land shadowing with wings. The ambassadors then going out to the people are missionaries. Missionaries. Yeah, missionaries. Take the gospel yeah. message forth. Right. And if you look in verse 3, it says, They'll go out to inhabitants of the world, the dwellers in the earth, see ye when he lifteth up an ensign. We love that word, on the mountains. And of course, literally that's a, a battle flag to which armies would rally, but we understand that as Isaiah uses it, yeah. it's typically a, a, a type for the restored gospel. I think that, that uh, verse 2 is interesting too when it talks about uh, <clears throat> go ye swift messengers. Uh, this, this notion of speed that, that is described in these light vessels of papyrus that uh, you know you can tie back into the earlier prophecy. But uh, isn't that how our missionaries are going forth today with speed? Uh, Incredible to, speed. To the far yeah. reaches of the earth. And you know, not only that, I think, I think if we limit that to just the elders and sisters of Israel, that, um, that we limit the prophecy because the gospel is also taught via the airwaves. Absolutely. And how fast does that word get out? That's swift. Those are swift messengers over the airway and over the web and over the internet. And, uh, uh, now, if we interpret <clears throat> the land shadow with wings being the Americas, then this pruning and cutting is taking place in verse 5. It seems to be a selective harvesting and cutting and culling and removing the dead wood and so forth until you get to the point where you have, as it says in verse 7, a present, yeah. those who've been gathered out and brought as a present, a, a, a present, a gift, if you will, of, of converted, redeemed, saved, saved right. individuals. And, and where does he take them? To the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, the Mount Zion. Uh, gathering to Zion is, is, is so... Uh, the, the dualistic imagery uh, uh, really comes together nicely there in the, the end of uh, yeah. the chapter. There's, there's temple imagery in, 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 a, in verse 7 as well. Mount Absolutely. Zion can also be considered uh, the sacred point of the gathering, which is our temples. And, of course, Prophet Joseph Smith taught, uh, what's, what do we do when we gather Israel? When we get them gathered, we build temples and they make and, covenants. And they and make that's, covenants that's within those makes temples. Them Zion. That's Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Good point. I've often thought that if I ever met <clears throat> Isaiah on some of these dualistic prophecies, I'd say, now, Isaiah, did you really mean both e Egypt <laughs> and the Latter-day uh, Gospel in Americas? Or do you mean one of the others? And I know what he'll say. He'll say, no, I didn't mean either. Here's what I really <laughs> meant. <laughs> All right. <laughs> But it's well, still valid because, as, as Nephi said, we liken all scriptures exactly. to ourselves. And, and so the analogy works. 
uh, even, even if it may not have necessarily been what, what uh, Isaiah initially and I think, I think one of the reasons it works is because Isaiah speaks about eternal principles. Exactly. And those, those who are righteous, those who keep the covenants will be blessed, while those who reject the covenants, those who reject the counsel of the Lord, ultimately are punished. And those, those principles are, are just as valid in our day as they were in Isaiah's day or Adam's day or any other time. Well said. I would hate to put any limits on Isaiah. My personal feeling is that he actually probably meant both yeah. and much more. Yeah. Yeah. As he did this, it's an economical way to prophesy, where one prophesy fits all this, one prophecy fits all dispensations, huh? Now we skipped over chapter 19. It too is a prophecy to Egypt. This is, you know, I love this chapter. Uh, it really shows the detail, the remarkable detail and clarity with which uh, Isaiah was able to prophesy uh, a burden of Egypt. We see in verse one, and he makes some really interesting prophecies. Of, specific prophecies about what's going to happen to Egypt. Um, let me read some of them and then maybe I can invite you, you brethren, to tell me what we see as some fulfillments of these prophecies. For example, verse 2, I will set the Egyptians against the Egyptians. Has there ever been civil war in Egypt? Lots of times. <laughs> over and over. That's an easy one, right? Yeah, yeah that's, that's easy. I think when Isaiah gave that prophecy, they probably said, well, Isaiah, anyone yeah, knows yeah, that. Yeah. Anyone yeah, that knows that. That happens all the time. Right? How about verse 4? The Egyptians will I give over into the hand of a cruel Lord. Now, that may have sounded a little strange to uh, Isaiah's contemporaries because Egypt was quite a, a, a military yeah. might in its own right. Has Egypt ever been given over into the hand of a cruel Lord? Over. It, it, in fact, we have a hard time trying to decide who that is. Uh, uh, the Ethiopian pharaoh, uh, Assyrian kings, uh, both Sargon and Sennacherib came against uh, uh, and invaded Egypt. Esarhaddon later, Persians, Artaxerxes. Uh, Alexander the Great, Rome, the Muslim con conquest, and you know e even today uh, there's there's uh, or not today but after that the uh, Mamluks. I mean it's it's just the history of Egypt has been one conquest after another. No, Napoleon. Napoleon, yeah. British. Uh, very it's, very good. Yeah. So from the time yeah, of this yeah. prophecy on, there's just been wave after wave of times when they've been in the hands of a cruel yeah. lord. Really, Egypt ceased to be a world power about this time and, and became a pawn of, of whatever conqueror came after that. Egypt never regained the glory that it had uh, prior to this time. Now verse 5. And the water shall fail from the sea, and the river shall be wasted and dried up. If you're talking Egypt and you're talking about a river, you're talking the Nile. Nile. Yeah. Well, what do you think Isaiah's people thought of this? Uh, I, they had to know what the Nile was. I mean, the Nile was the most reliable, you know, that's where they went to Egypt because the Nile, uh, during times of famine and drought, because Egypt always had water. And yet he's saying, you know, that which everybody relies upon is, is not yeah. in fact going yeah. to be. Didn't Herodotus say that uh, what Egypt is, is the, the gift, gift of, of the, the Nile. Nile yeah. right? More <laughs> water flows down the Nile River in one day and all the waters of Israel in a year, they claim. Amazing. It's an amazing it, it, it's thing. A, it's, it, it's a phenomenal. Yeah. And uh, here yeah. Isaiah has the audacity yeah. to prophesy that the waters of the Nile are going to be dried up. In fact, as he turns, he continues to talk about the effects of this. They <clears> shall, <throat> they, we don't know, he doesn't identify exactly who that is, but they shall turn the rivers far away. They're going to divert them. They're going to turn them away far away and the brooks of the defense will be emptied and dried up. The region of flags will wither. The paper weed reads by the brooks. By the mouse will be gone. The fishers will mourn in verse 8 and lament. The flax and all those that work in fax, flax will be confounded. They'll be broken. Uh, this terrible, he's describing this terrible ecological disaster that will follow because the Nile River has been turned away. So what do we understand is the fulfillment of this prophecy? Well, some at least have suggested that, you know, the uh, uh, Aswan, Aswan Dam and, and the, the ecological consequences of that, the, the increased salinization of the soil uh, and uh, uh, whole fishing industries uh, uh, drying up uh, in, in the Nile are, are possibly one interpretation of that. Yeah, in fact, I believe that's exactly what he has in mind. Um, you know, the building of the Aswan Dam was supposed to bring Egypt back into being a world power. They were supposed to generate enough hydroelectric energy to power the country and, and save and store all this water behind the dam and use it as they needed. And um, they didn't do an ecological impact study. <laughs> uh, and consequently, all the plants and animals that had built their whole life cycle around the annual inundation are devastated. 
yeah. and, and they die out. And, and the, the, I guess that the annual inundation fertilized the land every oh, year. Oh, yes, absolutely. So what's happened to all the silt that it brought down every year? Where did it's, it end it's, up? It's piling up there behind the Aswan Dam, and, and pretty soon you're going to have a big mud hole. And so uh, instead, instead of, of being a place to store water, all it's done is taking the water and spread it out over a larger yeah. surface area, and yeah. you're, it evaporates. You're losing yeah. more. Okay. Now, I, I think, again, uh, looking at our, our dualistic uh, aspects of Isaiah, I think he's also saying the true source of, of, of water is the Lord. And, and you can't rely on Egypt uh, for you know, the, the, the living waters uh, that are Christ and, and our Father. Uh, so, Good point. Uh, you know, he really, he gets scathing in his rebuke of the people that make the decision to turn this river away. Yeah. Look in verse 11. Surely the princes of Zon, that's a capital city, are fools. The counsel of the wise counselors of Pharaoh has become brutish. How can ye, how say ye unto Pharaoh, I am the son of the wise? How can you even say that you're a wise person when you've done such a thing as this? The son of ancient kings. I mean, Egypt had, had the, the, the longest unbroken history of, 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 of uh, rulers that, uh, of any nation in the world. They, they had this huge... Uh, wealth of, of ancient lore and, and, and tradition, and, and he's saying, you know, it's, you've turned into fools uh, in, instead of, you know, uh, building on, on the, the supposed wisdom that you claim to have. Remarkable prophecy. Uh, that had to sound so strange to Isaiah's contemporaries as well as this next prophecy. Look at verse 16 uh, and verse 17 here. Uh, you know, Israel, Egypt has been a military might and uh, all these, all these many years, and look what it's, he says about them. In that day shall Egypt be like unto a woman. It shall be afraid and fear because of the shaking of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which it shaketh over it. And the land of Judah shall be a terror unto Egypt. I wonder again what Isaiah's contemporaries must have thought when yeah. he tells the Jews, yeah, someday the, the Egyptians are going to be afraid of you. How do we see this fulfilled? Well, we've certainly seen that. Uh, Fairly recently, uh, Yom Kippur War, uh, and so on. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I have here in my notes in 48, 56, 67, and Yom Kippur War in 73. 73. Yeah. Um, and I think on a more symbolic level, it also symbolizes those who, who trust in the, the arm of the flesh will, will eventually uh, fear for the Lord because he, you know, he, has all, he has all power, and he's the source of power. And, and so, you know, taking, taking Egypt as a, as a symbol of, 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 of worldly power and, and, and Judah or Israel as a symbol of heavenly power, those who trust in worldly power will ultimately shake before, those, before the Lord. I, I think that's a great, um, a great typology because in, in verse 17, the land of Judah, which I think can represent Judah's God, that's Jehovah. Sure. sure. Um, he'll be a terror unto Egypt. Well, what's the terror? I, it sounds a little strange that I would make this connection, but I think the terror, in a sense, is the gospel of Jesus Christ that can come into a country and can change hearts and terrorize people, quite frankly, who've had power that don't want that kind of influence into, the, in, in, into their country. But it seems to suggest in 18 and 19 and 20 that that's exactly what's going to happen. The Egyptians are going to get the gospel. Yeah, it, this, this is something that even in, <clears throat> for us today is hard to imagine. Egypt uh, becoming converted to the Lord, uh, a temple of the Lord being built in Egypt. Yeah, you're um, speaking there, verse 18, 19, 20. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lord shall be known to Egypt. The Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day. Uh, the Lord will smite Egypt, and he will smite and heal it. And they shall turn, return even to the Lord, and, he sh and shall be entreated of them, and he shall heal them. Uh, here again, we, we see uh, God is not just the God of Israel, but the God of the whole earth. And he cares for and loves the Egyptians, and he wants them uh, to be converted as well. And this is something that's going to happen, uh, something I, I look forward to. Uh, this is going to be a remarkable uh, yeah. miracle, as miraculous as the Soviet Empire. Uh, collapsing and, and, and turning, uh, and, and the missionary work that we've got there. It's hard to imagine how this is going to happen, but the Lord can do it. Uh, so it, it really, uh, this is a, today. It's a Muslim country, you know, 40 plus million Muslims, and 
you know, we've not made inroads yet with, with this group of people, but it's coming. That day is coming. You know, you give me the thought that maybe uh, when we read verses 1 mm. through 17, we read these prophecies that must have been just preposterous to Isaiah's contemporaries, and they must have thought, how could this ever happen? Now, we have the benefit of historical hindsight, and we see, you know, these things that sounded absurd to them, were, they were accomplished by the hand of God. Now, in our day, we read verses 18 through the end of this, and we say, this is preposterous. How could this ever happen? That, that the gospel could go there and uh, to me perhaps the most remarkable of all are the last uh, verses 23 through 25 I read this and I think about the countries and what's happening politically in these countries today and what he says about them and I wonder how could it happen it says in verse 23 in that day shall there be a highway or a road out of Egypt to Assyria well, that's not too hard but look what happens then the Assyrian shall come to Egypt and the Egypt into Assyria and the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. And who are they serving? Verse 24, In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall say, bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt my people, and Assyria the work of my hands, and Israel mine inheritance. That, 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 that is made even uh, more uh, uh, contemporary if we replace Assyria with Iraq, which is what it is. So the time comes when you have Egypt and Israel and Iraq joined together in brotherhood serving the Lord. Oh, you, a remarkable prophecy. You can see it too as well. The gospel uh, brings shared equality and peace. How about the Americans, the Germans, and the Japanese? At one time all enemies today the gospel, um, you can have the saints in, in America and Germany and, and, and uh, Japan sit together in a bond of love and unity. And uh, clearly that, that's going to happen as well. It's going to be exciting to see how this unfolds. <clears throat> I'd love to see it happen in my life. I'd love to be a part of it to see how God's going to bring about this prophecy and make it a reality. Thank you, brother. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org.